Mark Wilson, the, the figures you're unveiling, they look good. Are they as good as they seem? You know, John, I want to get Aviva to get a reputation for doing what we say we're going to do. We've got a number of key metrics and they're all moving in the right direction. So it's been a very satisfactory set of results. If you have a look at some of the underlying figures, our net profit after tax has moved from a loss of three billion to a profit of 2.15 billion. Uh, that's, that's some good progress. If you have a look at expenses, they're down about 360 million. Cash flow to the group, which is a pretty important metric, that's up 40%. And then look at the growth metrics, like value of new business. Value of new business is up 13%. Now all these key metrics are uh, above consensus in the market. Uh, that's helpful, but we know we've still got a long way to go. Yeah, isn't there going to be a tendency for people in Aviva to think, Phew, we've turned this round, we can relax now? You know, I think that's an issue with turnarounds. When you do a turnaround, the tendency for people is to focus on all the successes and celebrate them and not focus on the issues. That leads to complacency and that leads to poor results. I want to guard against that complacency at Aviva. I want to make sure we focus equal attention on the issues and then make sure we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. You've talked about a number of key metrics, but you're laying an emphasis on one in particular, namely cash. Why? Well, cash is important. Cash brings clarity. Cash brings certainty. Cash in a business, in my mind, is still king. We can use whatever accounting basis and whatever metrics we like, cash is still king. The problem at Aviva was never profit. Aviva's a profit-making machine. The problem was turning that profit into cash at the group level, getting the cash up to the group so that we could increase dividends, we can pay down debt. So cash is important. And the whole market's been rightly focused on that as a key metric. Now that metric's gone up by 40%. Uh, that's certainly uh, a bit ahead of expectation where we thought would be at this time. Uh, and that's helpful. It gives us more financial flexibility. You said you want to cut out fat in Aviva. And I think you set a target of £400 million. Are you there? Have you got there yet? Yeah, well, the £400 million target was for 2014. We've just delivered a result of £360 million reduction. Uh, that's uh, quite satisfactory progress. I think that's entirely adequate for what we were planning. Uh, and that has come through to the bottom line, and that's pretty helpful. We still have more to do, and uh, our expenses are still too high. Part of what we want to do is reallocate some of future expense reductions. We want to reallocate that to other initiatives. Initiatives like digital, initiatives like automation, initiatives like investment in our predictive analytics of our underwriting, which will improve our business long term. What is the value of new business? I mean, is there growth in life insurance? It's easy for anyone in a business to just get pure growth. It's easy to get top line growth in an insurance business. Anyone can do that. That's not where I want to focus Aviva. In Aviva, we want to focus on what's, what's valuable growth. Now, you can define that in life insurance by value of new business, or V&B as we call it. That's the value of the new business you sell. That's the profitability of that new business. And so that's the key metric we want to grow. Um, and the results were pretty compelling. Um, we focus very much on our balance sheet, fixing the balance sheet and ticking off those issues. But as we tick those off, people ask that question, well, where's your growth coming from? I think we've shown in 2013, we've got some pretty exciting markets to focus on. Things like Indonesia, we recently did a deal with the Astro Group. They're an outstanding conglomerate. They're the largest conglomerate in Indonesia. They have extraordinary distribution power. And so we can help tap into that extraordinary distribution power, bring our life insurance experience to them. And that's the sort of businesses that you'd expect to see delivering over the years to come. We've talked about, you talked about the boxes that you've ticked, and we've talked about a lot of boxes ticked. What about the combined operating ratio, which I know is your way of measuring how general insurance is doing? How's that going? Well, I think that was marginally disappointing. It was flat over last year. It was actually marginal deterioration. It went from uh, 97 to 97.3, albeit a little bit ahead of consensus. But I think uh, we were impacted in part by the weather. Uh, we still need to see some of the predictive analytic work come through broadly. 
But one of the advantages of Aviva on that combined ratio is our diversity. We're diverse in terms of product lines and we're diverse in terms of geographies. So we were certainly impacted less than a number of our peers. When you say that affected by the weather, what do you mean? The, the flooding here or was it because there have been you know, other parts of the world that have also suffered very badly? Well, Canada had a one in 200 year event uh, that impacted us, uh, which we told the market about last year. Uh, the flooding here in the UK has been a significant weather event. Albeit, so far in 2014, the claims we've paid have been very much in line or marginally, maybe marginally worse than in line with our long-term average. Uh, and I think that probably shows the strength of our underwriting capability and our predictive analytics. Uh, that has given us a pretty good result in that area. You're a consumer-facing business. What can you do as the CEO to help people when the floods are there and to show that you are in touch with what people's genuine concerns are? Well, the floods are one of the tragic moments and one of the events you see how they impact people's lives. And we've seen the floods both in Canada and we've seen them more recently in the UK. Uh, what can we do? Well, what I've done is I've gone out and seen these customers. I've gone up to Somerset and Worcester and Gloucester and I've been standing in people's homes, in my wellies, in their kitchens, sometimes with water up to just below my knees. And they're telling me the tragedy, how they've lost their dream home, how their lives have been turned upside down. These are the moments of truth. These are when we deliver or we don't deliver. You know, when, um, when you see it like that and you see the impact, you see also how our frontline people really go out of the way to deliver in these times. We've had people on the road seven days a week helping people claim, knocking on our customers' doors to help them to claim. We've had people, what we call the Aviva Army, in yellow raincoats filling sandbags to help people protect their homes. And over this entire period, since the floods began in the UK, we have accepted 99.9% .9 of these claims and we're helping people get through it. Uh, this is when I think we deliver, and through these floods, I think our people have been quite exceptional. Very interesting. I want to talk to you about a subject I know, and I know you do a lot of meetings with investors and shareholders, and I gather it comes up every time you go out, and that is the intercompany loan. You're saying that this year you are taking that off the table. You're not sweeping it under the carpet, are you? you know, hardly sweeping it under the carpet. I'd argue we've bought it out into the sunshine. As you say, I've had um, several hundred meetings with investors over the last 12 months. It's been raised in every meeting. Partly the reason it's been raised is because I've highlighted it as an issue. It's an issue because the investors were concerned that there would be a lot of cash needed to fix and reduce this internal loan, and that would be cash that would be taken away from dividends or cash that were taken away from reducing external leverage. Over the last 12 months, we've reduced this by 1.7 billion. And just putting that in context, that's at a time when I said we'd reduce it by 600 million over three years. So I think we've exceeded expectations there. What we have announced in the results now is that we will take that loan down to a sustainable level of 2.2 billion. And we'll do that through a mixture of cash and non-cash but for the cash part, that's from our existing liquidity resources, so it won't take away from the future cash generation of the business. A few important points to note here. We've been working very closely with the regulator. The regulator has agreed and signed off. This is the PRA. They've agreed and signed off our plans. And I think we'll probably get a bit of credit for the progress and the track record we've had on this in the last 12 months on delivering. So yes, I believe we've taken it off the table and I believe we've taken away what's quite a major overhang in our stock. So the investment thesis is cash flow and growth. Cash flow, looking good. Where is the growth coming from? And that's the inevitable question. As we tick off all the balance sheet issues, the next question is, so where's the growth? Well, we've got 13% growth uh, in terms of value of new business over the last 12 months. Uh, that was probably a bit higher than, you know, than even I was anticipating. Now, just to be absolutely clear, I believe we need growth out of all our markets. I don't care whether you're a cash-producing market, like the UK or France, or a turnaround market like Italy, Ireland and, and Spain, or an emerging market like Turkey or Poland or Southeast Asia or China. 
I expect all these markets to deliver growth. France was a good example. France had about 39% growth in value of new business in a market where people say is mature and the economy isn't that robust. So they've proved they can do it. Uh, look, another one, Asia, 65% growth over the last 12 months. Uh, they had a, I'll call it highly satisfactory result. And uh, the turnaround markets though, uh, just for a bit of balance, the turnaround markets still need a lot of work. Italy and Spain were well down in value of new business, albeit all of those businesses paid a dividend. And so that's tangible progress. That's the first real sign of a turnaround. And that's helpful. How much do you depend on what the world economy is doing? Do you just kind of, is it like a rising tide and you float off because the tide rises on the global economy? Or is it down to the decisions that you're making? Aviva is very much a self-help story. So it's a turnaround story, but a self-help story. If we get a tailwind going forward from a European recovery, well, that's great. That's helpful. Uh, but that's not what we rely on. That's not what we plan on. I just want to talk about uh, the dividend. Uh, you slashed it last year. There's a modest increase this year. Is that going to be enough to satisfy shareholders? Well, I'd probably prefer the term rebased rather than slashed. But uh, nevertheless, it was a difficult time. We had to make quite a painful decision at the time to uh, rebase the dividend uh, by 44%. Of course, we eliminated the script at the same time, which the market welcomed. I think now, looking back 12 months later, uh, most investors would absolutely agree it was the right decision, albeit painful at the time. And with our stock price up 50% over that period, clearly the overall market agrees with that decision as well. We have increased it, we've increased it, our cash flows improved, our profits improved, the financial position of the group has improved. And it's important that our capital has increased quite markedly. Our capital surplus has increased to 8.3 billion pounds. So if you take that back a couple of years, we're in a markedly different position. But we've still got more to do. We've still got a lot more to do. And it would be wrong to, to declare victory and say just because we've increased a dividend, um, that I'm in any way happy with that. And, and, and you talk about the turnaround that's been achieved. It's also been achieved by a flurry of management changes. Does that imply that the team you had wasn't good enough? Uh, I think if you have a look back in our results, it's clear our results weren't good enough. So what I've done, I've brought in some of the skills we needed in transformation and HR and IT and asset management, etc. I've also made some key internal promotions which gave air to some of the outstanding key talent we had in the business. So I had to reshape the team. Uh, I think we made a lot of progress there. Uh, the value sets are pretty consistent across that group about, and the belief about what we're trying to do. And yeah, we've made some good progress there. Here we are sitting on the day of your financial results. You have to report regularly what you're doing, six monthly, three monthly. And yet you caught talk about legacy. How can you look to the long term, and I would imagine the insurance industry is perhaps the most long term that you could possibly be involved in, when you've got the stock market and investors looking every few months at what you're doing? You know what, I don't see that as mutually exclusive. In fact, one of our core values that we have as a team is about creating legacy. I describe it as being a good ancestor, making sure that the decisions we make today we're as proud of in 10 or 20 years' time. And if you think in that mindset, it changes the decisions. Now, of course, we still need to get quarterly results. Of course, we still need to get our yearly results. And investors' appetites are rightly relentless. And I've got no problem with that. But what I won't compromise on, I won't compromise on decisions, short-term decisions, rather than decisions that are right for the long term. A good example of that would have been our decision on the dividend. The easy decision 12 months ago would have been to say, let's let it go and we'll struggle through it and try and find an outcome. The right decision was to say, we want to rebase it, we want to eliminate the script and put us on a sound investment proposition, sound investment platform. That's what I mean by create legacy. It's also about the type of investments you make. We're a long-term company. We make long-term decisions. We've got long-term liabilities. Investing in things like infrastructure. Making us those sort of decisions, we can help leave a legacy for society as well. The sort of countries you're in. We make decisions on growth that we think can be the right decision in 10 or 20 years' time and not just focus on the short term. That's what I mean by create legacy. 
And I don't think that's inconsistent at all with short-term results. And just finally, I don't know whether you have a crystal ball that kind of you look into to see the future. I just wonder whether you, you feel that it's all rosy out there or you're rather wary about the future. My crystal ball, I think, takes on all the characteristics of a kaleidoscope. It's a bit hard to see what's going on sometimes in the economies. But you know, I'm a believer in economic cycles. And Europe's gone through an economic down cycle and over time it will certainly recover. Uh, I'm a believer in emerging markets and you can see some strong growth out of them as well. So I'd, I think it would be naive to suggest there won't be bumps in the way, but Europe and our key markets, that's why we're in these markets. I think you can see quite a strong strategic path forward. But fundamentally, Aviva is a, f a self-help story. We're a turnaround story, but we're fundamentally a self-help story. And so we don't require great markets to get some pretty good results. And I think that's helpful. So if you look back over the last 12 months, have we made some progress? Sure, we've made some. Is it maybe a bit faster than people anticipated? Yeah, maybe it is. Have we unlocked the full potential out of Aviva? Not even close. Mark Wilson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John.